I'm excited about what God is doing in the life of our church. I'm so excited to hear the stories of, um, of healings. I'm excited to hear the stories of marriages being restored, of, of finances being turned around and debts relieved. And just there's some so many incredible things that God is doing. And, you know, banner years, it's not just wishful thinking. It's not just, you know, uh, it's not just a nice little hallmark saying that prints nicely on a hoodie or on a sticker. No, banner year is that we're just simply taking God at his word. We're, t- uh, we're looking at the promises that are all throughout his word, and we're, we're choosing to accept them in our lives, and we're just going to walk them out in our life. Psalm 84.11 tells us that for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. So, man, I'm fired up. I'm ready to go today. I'm excited to, to be talking about uh, 52. It's the series that we're in, talking about 52 to a new you. Come on, everybody say 52. 52 to a new you. If you've missed any of the messages, I highly recommend that you check out the church website, look on YouTube, uh, listen to the podcast, however you take in uh, the message, whatever works best for you, go ahead, check that out and, uh, and catch up with the series. It's been, it's been amazing. Basically, what we've been talking about is we've been talking about the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king of Persia, but when Nehemiah hears about uh, the state that Jerusalem is in, he, he kind of gets this, this personal conviction. He gets kind of this, this vision for his life, and he realizes that, that he needs to leave Persia, and he needs to go back to Jerusalem in order to help rebuild the walls. And so what does he do? He goes before the king. He lets him know, hey, I, this is what I'm sensing. This is what I'm feeling. Would you grant me permission to go to, back to Jerusalem and, uh, and start rebuilding this wall? And the king not only gives him permission, but he also gives him supplies and, uh, and kind of a security escort back to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah shows up uh, with, a, with a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, spoiler alert, he is able to rally the people together, and they rebuild the wall in just 52 days. This whole series, we've been talking about when we partner with God, we get a God-sized vision for our lives, and, uh, and we do what we can, and we trust in God to do what only He can do. And uh, I believe that, that we can see incredible things change in our lives in just 52 days. So uh, as we've been unpacking this story, we've talked about the theme of, of Revive. And we talked about how revival starts in me. We can experience the banner years of our lives Uh, We can experience God's favor in every area of our life, spiritually, uh, relationally, financially, physically, emotionally, in every area of our lives. Revival starts in me. Last week, Pastor Sam shared a powerful message about reimagine, and we talked about how we've been placed on this planet to, to fulfill the five purposes in our life. And those five purposes are fellowship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism, and worship. That's why we've been placed on this earth. And if we're confused about kind of why we're here, if we're confused about what we should be doing with our lives, if we pursue those five purposes, we start to pursue what God has for us. I love the quote that Steve Jobs said. He said, if what you are working on excites you, you don't have to be pushed. The vision will pull you. Where does the vision pull you? The the vision pulls you to action. The vision pulls you to start rebuilding the walls in your life that may lie in ruins. And so as we talk about 52 to a new you, and as maybe you're following along on the sticker or on the program or on the hoodie of the person who's sitting in front of you, and you've seen, all right, we've, we've talked about Revive. We've talked about reimagine. Now you'll see we're going to talk about rebuilding here today. Because um, after Nehemiah, after he gets to Jerusalem, he takes some time and he starts to kind of scout out the area. He, he walks along the path that the wall should have been standing, but instead he's, he's climbing over rubble and debris and he's trying to kind of figure out exactly what this, what this wall is going to look like uh, for Jerusalem. And so after he's done scoping out the land, he gathers the Jewish leaders and he, and he, pre- and he presents to them the vision that God has given him. He says this in chapter 2, verse 17. Then I said to them, them being the Jewish leaders, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. 
will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. That's a really good motivational speech right there. That's like, that's like Andy Reid going into the fourth quarter, down 10 points in the Super Bowl. That's his comeback speech to win the Super Bowl. That is Nehemiah's, you know, he's given his best pep rally that he can give. And I love the, the response because he, uh, Nehemiah, he was able to take a group of people who were, who were kind of complacent. They were just kind of okay with the fact that, that the walls were lying in ruins. They hadn't done anything about it. And Nehemiah takes them from a place of complacency to a place of, all right, let's start rebuilding this wall. Let's make this happen. You see, vision pulls you. It was a God-given vision that pulled Nehemiah out of his comforts as a cupbearer to the king of Persia into a foreign land that his, that his ancestors occupied with, the, with walls that were lying in ruins. It was a God-given vision that that Nehemiah shared with the Jewish leaders that that rallied the troops, that that brought them together in order to serve a greater vision. You see, vision pulls you. Sometimes it pulls you out of your comfort zone. Sometimes vision will pull you into great leaps of faith. Sometimes vision will make you work hard. But I promise you, as you you fulfill the destiny that God has for you, vision will always pull you towards blessing. Because when you're able to accomplish what you've been placed on the earth for, whether you're out of your comfort zone, whether you're taking great leaps of faith, whether you're working hard, that stuff doesn't matter. It's going to be the blessing of fulfilling the purpose that you've been placed on the planet to accomplish. It was the vision of Freedom Life that, that pulled my wife and me here over five years ago. And it's a passion of ours here today to see people to, to serve the greater vision. It's why we encourage people to, to partner with God, to, to accomplish all that God has called them to. It's why we never hesitate to encourage people to, to sign up for Growth Track, to go through Growth Track, and to join the dream team. To use the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that God has given you to serve a greater vision. It's why we encourage people to join a small group, to be a part of those iron sharpens iron relationships, those people who are going to help to move you forward faster into all that God has for you. It's why we encourage you to, to come out to be a part of the Flash Flood events, because we believe that uh, as you serve a greater vision, vision that uh, that your life is going to receive more purpose and, and, and understanding as to why you've been placed on this planet. Again, is it always easy? No. But when we set aside our personal comfort and we, and we pursue all that God has for us, it's an amazing blessing. Can I tell you that on a Sunday morning, my alarm clock rarely goes off. And I just kind of, I wake up and it's like 5.15, 5.30, which is not normal for me at all. But I'm just excited. Man, I love Sundays. I love being here. And I love the fact that we get to be a part of what God is doing here in church. You see, I've been been praying all week for Sunday to come and for God to to show up and to show off and to to bring the life change that we're believing for in people's lives. And so I've been been praying for this moment. And so when Sunday morning comes, man, 515, 530, I'm, I'm awake. I'm ready to go. It's like, yes, God, I get to partner with you today and to be a part of a greater vision, a part of what you're doing in people's lives. How many of you guys want to be a part of something like that? Come on, who wants to be a part of something like that? All right, a couple people, a little bit of enthusiasm. Well, hey, if you're not enthused about that, is that a word, enthused? It is today. All right. If you're, I'm sticking with it. If you're not enthused about it, join in. Be a part of Growth Track. It starts next week. You're going to hear about uh, a little bit more of the vision of our church and, and about where we're headed. And man, it is, it is an exciting time to be alive. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about, uh, we had Vision Sunday. And we talked about, hey, we're not just, we're not just uh, you know, here to, to build a new building. No, we're building an ark for the saving of generations. We get to be a part of what God is doing. And man, we get to leave a lasting legacy that's going to go far beyond our life here on earth. We get to spend time in eternity hanging out with people who we never met here on earth, but because of our generosity, because of our willingness to give up our time, our talent, and our treasure, there are going to be people who are in heaven because of what you sow and what you invest here today. And so that's the kind of vision that I want to be a part of. 
I want to be a part of a vision that, that I can't accomplish on my own. Man, that's boring. If you live a life for a vision that you can do on your own, that's boring. But when you partner with God and when you fulfill all that he has called you to, man, that's, there's no telling what God can do in and through you. My goal is I want to be able to live full and die empty. I want to go out swinging for the fences. Like, I want to be able to be used by God. And I want to, you know, I'm going to work hard and do my very best. But I'm also going to rely on God to show up and, and to do what only he can do and bring it all to fruition. Proverbs, tw Proverbs 29, 18 reminds us that where there is no vision, the people perish. I believe with all my heart the importance of serving a greater vision. If you want to live your life on purpose and for a purpose, you have to serve a greater vision. Not just a vision for your own life, but a vision that's going to make a difference in the world around you. Man, I love the, the people's response to Nehemiah's vision. And when he, he kind of casts it, when he shares what the vision is that's on the inside of him, their response is, all right, let's do this. Like, let's start rebuilding. And, and we see like an immediate action. And so they move forward with rebuilding the wall. I believe that, that God has me here today to share this message with you to, to spark something on the inside of you. Maybe to reignite something on the inside of you. Maybe there's a, a vision, a destiny that God has placed on the inside of you that you, you know that it's real. But at the same time, you've just kind of taken steps of comfort and you've taken steps of complacency. I believe that God has me here right now speaking to you in the house and you online. And I believe that, that God wants to reignite that, that vision and that destiny that he has for you. For Nehemiah, that vision and that destiny was to rebuild a wall. I can't define what it might be for you, but I do know that if we want to say 52 days to a new you, that there's going to have to be some things that need built and rebuilt in your life. And so over the next few moments, I want to take time and I want to talk about how to rebuild the walls in your life. The first part is we have to be willing to take action. If you want to experience change in your life, there needs to be an action step. We can't just think about it. We can't even just pray about it. We can't just get a vision. We can't just write it down. But there, there needs to be an action. At some point along the way, we need to start bending down, picking up the bricks, and putting them together to create the wall. There needs to be an action. Because recognition doesn't bring revival. Action does. You see, in these, these 52 days to a new you, you need to work like it depends on you, but pray like it depends on God. Last week, Pastor Sam shared that, that we need to, to remember that it's a divine partnership, that we cannot without God, but God will not without us. He desires and he chooses to use each and every one of us to be able to fulfill the plans and the purposes that he's placed each of us on this earth to accomplish. I just want to reread the, uh, the key verses that I share with you here today. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be a disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. The reason that I reread this is because on one hand, it fascinates me, and on the other hand, it irritates me like this scripture and, and these verses. And, and you see, the, the, the city of Jerusalem, it wasn't a desolate land. Like, there was people who were living there. These people, they would have walked over the mounds of rubble. They would have stood on, on piles of debris, and they would have seen what was supposed to be a wall that was completely destroyed all around them, but they never did anything about it. They looked around, and they probably thought, man, somebody should really do something about this, but nobody ever took the action to make it happen. Now, I'll be the first one to admit that I, I see this happen sometimes in my life as well. Like, for example, um, you know, if I'm at home in the evening and, and I come in, I, I'll, like, drop my gym bag in our room, and Rachel and I will start talking, and, and you know, we'll just kind of be going throughout the evening, and I'll probably walk by that nasty gym bag four or five times. And at some point, Rachel will be like, hey, would you, could you, like, put that somewhere else? Like, it smells terrible. It's messing up this room. Like, what, like, why is it even sitting here? And literally, for, like, the first time, I recognized its existence. Like, oh, I walked by it five times. Didn't even recognize it was there. Come on. Anybody else like me in this place? All right, cool. Heath, you're honest. I appreciate you. And uh, everybody else, mm, we'll see. Uh, so, so, but, so there are things in life that we, we just miss. We don't see all the times. But 
this is a stinking wall, people. Like, this is your sense of security. This is your protection. Now, scholars would say that it was, it was shameful. It was embarrassing. The fact that this wall was, was just completely destroyed. Like, as a people group, they had no form of protection. They had no security. And so it was a source of embarrassment. Yet they continued to walk right past it without bringing any change. The Bible tells us that lazy people want much but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Can I tell you what a lazy person does? A lazy person will see a problem, they'll point their finger, and they will declare, that is a problem. But that's it. Like, that's, that's where they're done. Like, okay, I'm done. I, I have let everybody know that's a problem. But they don't lift their hand to help. They don't come with a solution. No, they just declare what a problem is. Really, we're like the, the people of Jerusalem who simply walked by the broken wall saying, man, somebody should do something about this, pointing to the fact that it's a problem, but never actually moving towards action. I want to encourage you to think, just be, be introspective. What are those things in maybe your life that, that needs to be rebuilt, that you've just kind of been complacent with, that you've just become comfortable with? Maybe God has me here today to share that with you, that maybe there needs to be an action, that there needs to be a rebuilding in your life. Maybe it's your family or your community. It's easy to point out the problem, but not everybody takes the step to start rebuilding. It's interesting. Uh, the, the whole nation of Israel was being led out of Egypt, uh, they were being led out of captivity from Egypt, and they were, they were marching towards their freedom. And in the process of going towards their freedom, they, they, they kind of come up against the Red Sea. As they come up against the Red Sea, they kind of turn back, and they recognize the fact that the Egyptian army is, is kind of coming up behind them, and they realize what happens, and they're trying to get the Israelites back into captivity. So they're chasing them from, from behind, and, and you've got the Red Sea in front of them. And what does the whole nation of Israel do? They don't get creative. They don't, all right, let's put our minds together. Let's figure out, like, what we can do in order to get across the Red Sea. Let's build a really big boat. Noah did it once. Let's try it again. Like, they don't, they don't come with creative solutions. What do they do? They point a finger at Moses, and they say, this is a problem. You let us out of here. Like, you let us out of Egypt, and so that way we can die in the desert. Like, what are you going to do about it? Come on, do something. And it's Moses who actually takes the action, who's, who steps forward, who has that divine partnership with God. And so he, he stretches out his arms over the Red Sea, and God shows up, and he parts the waters of the Red Sea. And the, Israelite, uh, and the Israelites are able to escape the Egyptian army, walk through the sea, and move into their freedom. It reminds me of, of David's brothers. Again, part of the, the Israelite army, but, but this time they're faced with the, the, uh, the Philistines who are in front of them. And so they're sitting around, David's brothers, they're sitting around, they're complaining about this massive, this giant problem that's in front of them by the name of Goliath. While they're sitting around their campfire and, and complaining and talking about how, how big their problem is, David shows up on the scene. He's like, all right, what do we got here? We got a couple rocks. All right, put them in my pocket. I've got a sling in my hand. Let's go kill this Goliath. And, uh, and so he shows up, and, and he brings freedom to the Israelites again from the, from, the, uh, from the Philistine army. He brings freedom because of his willingness to partner with God and to take action in his life. Now, these guys, they're not perfect. They have their flaws but they're remembered thousands of years later because of their divine partnership with God and their willingness to take action. You see, 52 to a new you, it's going to take action. It's not, you're not going to be able to be content with the status quo. You're going to have to move forward into all that God has for you. To rebuild the walls, you have to be willing to take action, but you also have to be willing to use your influence. Nehemiah, he was obviously a man of influence. He was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. Now, honestly, when, when I first, like, you know, the first bunch of times that I read that, like, I was like, all right, cool, he's a cupbearer. And, like, in my mind, when I think of a cupbearer, I think of, like, this dude who shows up only when called for, like, hey, the king's thirsty. Okay, here comes the cupbearer. He brings out, you know, the king's favorite cup. It's got some water in it. And he, he runs up to the king. Here you are, sir. You know, the king takes a sip. He grabs the cup, runs back into, like, the dark parts of the castle where he's never to be heard or seen again until the king's thirsty again. Like, that's just kind of the, the picture that I get of a cupbearer. Maybe I watch too many movies. I don't know what it is, but that's just kind of the mental picture that I get of a cupbearer. But as I was going through this and as I was kind of researching what that meant for Nehemiah, I realized that a cupbearer is actually a really influential part 
of, uh, of the government. Like, he was actually, like, the number two in command. He would have been considered, like, a prime minister of the land. So it was, like, a really high government role that Nehemiah was in. And so Nehemiah, he understood the influence that he had on his life. He used that influence to, to leverage, to be able to, to talk with the king of Persia, to not only, you know, get the freedom to go to Jerusalem to rebuild, but he also, he doesn't come empty-handed. He comes with everything that he needs in order to start the process of rebuilding the wall. Again, he understands influence. And so when he goes to Jerusalem, he doesn't just get like, hey, all right, I'm just going to shout really loud from you know, a couple of these stones and see who shows up. No, he gathers some of the, 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 the leaders in Jerusalem, some of the, the Jewish leaders. He calls them together, and he, and he casts the vision first to them because he understands that they're people of influence in that city. And so when they take that vision and they spread it then amongst everybody else in the city, that the vision is going to be cast and there's going to be greater buy-in for everybody involved. And so he is a man who understands influence. And you may be sitting here today, and you may be thinking, man, that is awesome, Jason. That's great for Nehemiah. He's number two in the land. That's cool. I'm not some prominent member of society, though. Like, I don't have influence in my life. And I just want to take a moment, and I just want to say to those of you who are a committed follower of Jesus that you could not possibly be more wrong. You see, you're a child of God. You have royalty flowing in your veins. That God, uh, the God who created the universe, who spoke and the stars were created, who spoke and the world around us was formed. That same God knows your name and has placed a plan and a purpose on the inside of you. The spirit of God is inside of you. You are a friend of Jesus Christ, an heir with Christ, a citizen of heaven. First Peter 2.9 declares, and you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You see, you do have influence. You have the power of almighty God fighting in your corner. So live with confidence. Walk through life knowing that you're a child of God, knowing that the God almighty is fighting for you. Understand who you are and whose you are. You're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. You're blessed when you come and when you go. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the country. That's who God says you are. And so walk with the understanding, knowing who he says you are and what he will do for you. You see, you do have influence. And the quicker that you recognize God's hand over your life, the quicker you will not only be able to lead yourself well, but be able to lead those around you in the rebuilding of the walls and fulfilling your destiny. So we don't only use our influence, but we also need to be willing to use our affluence to help build the walls as well. We've mentioned a couple times now that, uh, that we hosted a prom for individuals with special needs called Night to Shine on Friday evening. And we partnered with the Tim Tebow Foundation in order to make it happen. It was, a, it was a powerful night. It was amazing to see the joy and the happiness and not only our guests, but also their caregivers and their families as well. It, it's powerful. It's amazing. You, you definitely want to be a part of it next year. But all of it was made possible because of Tim Tebow, his willingness not only to use his influence, but also his affluence. You see, it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And so not many of us here in this room or tuning in online are worth $13 million. I Googled it. That's how much Tim Tebow is apparently worth. And so not many of us are worth that. But that doesn't mean that we sit around and we wait for somebody else to bankroll the vision that God has placed on the inside of us. In fact, what we do is instead we, we take what Kurt was sharing earlier during our offering talk and we apply that to our lives. We, we sow generously and we trust God that he's going to show up and he's going to multiply our, our generosity. He's going to multiply what, what we've given in order to be able to to accomplish all that God has called us to. And see, we often talk about honoring God with our time, our talent, and our treasure. And the Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Again, it's that divine partnership with God. As we, as we begin rebuilding the walls in our life, it's going to take an investment, but it's storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. 
This past week, uh, I started preparing my taxes, which is terrible. I hate doing this. But, you know, I, I have to be a good, responsible adult. And so I started preparing the taxes. And so I'm going through everything. And I, I came across my giving letter from Freedom Life. And it just kind of showed how much that I had given throughout the year. And I'll be honest, I know that there are people who would look at that and they'd see how much, you know, my wife and I make. And they'd be like, why on earth would you give that much of your, of your salary away? Like, why would you give that much away? And, and honestly, I looked at it and I thought, man, that's it. That's all I gave. Man, I wish I could have given more. I wish I could have done more because I understand that, that as, as we give of our time, our talent, and our treasure, that God sees that and, and, and God is moving in the life of our church and people are streaming to the goodness of God. It makes every early morning work out, or wake up worth it. It makes every early morning that, you know, that we get to, to serve using our gifts and our talents that God has blessed us with, it makes it worth it. It makes every dollar given worth it worth it because it's people who are going to be in eternity because of our generosity. I want to be a bigger part of what God's doing in the life of our church. I wouldn't trade it for the world. You see, when we use our affluence to rebuild the wall, it's a, it's a way of becoming more dialed in. It's a way of being more invested into, uh, into what it is that God has called us to. I know it's true of my life, and I know it's true of your life as well. Here's kind of a, a funny example that I've realized uh, kind of from my role as, as campus pastor. I have the opportunity to kind of help with some of the different events that we host as Freedom Life. And, and sometimes we'll, we'll do some different events, and we'll encourage people to pre-register just so that way we can get a head count of, you know, how many people we need uh, for child care, how much food we need. And, you know, the cost is free but we just need to, to pre-register. And a bunch of people will pre-register, they'll sign up to be a part of it. But then, you know, there's no investment there. And so when something comes up that night, like, ah, don't worry about it. It didn't cost me anything. And so not as many people show up as had pre-registered. If you change that event and you just put a $5 uh, price tag on it and just say, hey, just uh, five bucks, that'll go towards food. 98% of the people who pre-registered will show up. And it's not a knock on anybody. It's just simply how we're wired. When we give of our time, our talent, and our treasure, when we use our affluence to go towards something, we're more invested in it. It's something that, that we want to see through to the end. What did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah took all the chips that were sitting on the table. He pushed them to the middle, and he said, I'm all in. Let's do this thing. Let's rebuild this wall. You see, we must be willing to take action. We must be willing to use our influence. We must be willing to use our affluence, and we must, and we must be willing to partner with others. You see, we're relational beings. One of our core values here at Freedom Life is you can't do life alone. That means that, that the wall that God has called you to rebuild in your life is impossible to complete by yourself. You see, my son, his name's Corbin. He's two years old, and he's kind of at that stage where he's starting to try to become, like, more independent, which is a lot of fun because it's great teaching and, and, and learning opportunities for him where, you know, all right, hey, it didn't work out the first time. Let's try something else. Let's try it again. Like, all right, let's, let's, let's teach you how to become more independent. And, and it's a lot of fun. There's some times when I have to say things like, all right, it didn't work out, but don't throw your fork across the room. Don't throw your food across the room. Just, just relax. Just breathe a little bit. We'll figure this thing out together. So sometimes that's the coaching. Other times I have to kind of step in and be like, no way. You are not old enough to be doing that. So like the other day, we were getting ready to go somewhere, and he looks at me and he says, Daddy, I drive. <laughs> no, you're not driving. Like there's not a chance. I value my life and your life way too much to let my two-year-old drive our car. Now, he's seen me do it hundreds of times. He's seen me take the keys, put it in the ignition. He's seen me put the car in drive. He's seen me grab hold of the steering wheel, and you know, away we go. So he, he gets parts of it, but he doesn't understand the full picture. I feel like that's how, how we were created. That's kind of the destiny that's on the inside of us. We're kind of like Corbin. We know parts of it, but we need other people. We need that divine partnership with God, and we need other people in our lives to kind of help us to be able to accomplish all that God has called us to. Any wall worth building, you can't accomplish on your own. If you can complete the job on your own, I would, I would say that you're probably missing the mark on all that God has for you, that you're falling a little bit short, that God has something greater for you because it really does take teamwork to make the dream work. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 tells us, 
And let, us, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What is this reminding of us? What is this reminding us of? The fact that we're relational beings, the fact that we need one another in our lives. If you read on to the chapter three of Nehemiah, you can start reading through the list of the names of the individuals and the parts of the wall and the gate that they were responsible for rebuilding. You see, Nehemiah didn't go out and in 52 days rebuild a whole wall by himself. Like this isn't an Amish barn raising. Like this is like he, he was, he gathered the help and the support uh, of the, the city of Jerusalem. Each person had a spot, no matter how great or how small. There, all right, there's a person whose role was to complete the dung gate. Like that guy, I don't know what he did to deserve that, but uh, like everybody was necessary from the, from the highest to the lowest. Everybody had a part to play. Everybody had a role in fulfilling the destiny that God had placed on them. You see, we need other people. We need to be willing to, to take action, to use our influence and our affluence and to partner with others in order to fulfill the vision that God has placed on the inside of us. And I believe that as we do that, that our lives, our families' lives, our communities, our church will never look the same again. We'll be better for it as we pursue the destiny that God has for us. Would you please stand with me? On August 28th, 1963, one of the most memorable speeches of all time was given. A man by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood before over 250,000 people, and he spoke of a dream that he had. A dream that, that one day, every citizen would be able to share the same liberties and freedoms, not dependent on their skin color, but because of, of who they were, a child of God. It was a powerful speech. It was a powerful moment that is often looked back on as one of the highlights of the civil rights movement. But what if, what if Dr. King had kept that dream to himself? What if he said, this is mine? Like, I'm supposed to do this. I'll, I'll just kind of do this on my own. Or, or maybe what if, what if he is just like, hey, listen, people aren't going to listen to me. I'm just, a, I'm just a child of a, of a pastor here in Georgia. Like, man, there's nobody's going to actually listen to me. Like, here I am. Like, I'm considered a, a, a second-class citizen. I, I'm, I'm like, I don't have rights. Like, nobody's going to actually listen to me. What if that was the approach that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had taken? Our world today would look radically different. I believe that there's a, there's a dream. There's a vision on the inside of you that needs to be released, that you need to share with people, that you, need to, that you need to take an action, you need to gather people, you need to have the divine partnership with God. And I believe that as we do that, our lives will never look the same. Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, go ahead and drop us a line, email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, Share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life, the best is still yet to come.